Security. This is a national four-year program which we launched in 2013. As a program, we seek to expand the production and conservation of ecologically grown, regionally adapted, and biodiverse seed in Canada. The program was made possible thanks to the generous support and championship of Mrs. Gretchen Bauda, who is a member of the Weston family. Her vision and championing of a secure and thriving Canadian seed system led to the establishment of the program, which is delivered by USC Canada in partnership with Seeds of Diversity Canada through the generous support of the W. Garfield Weston Foundation. And links to all of these groups can be found on our program homepage at seedsecurity.ca. So a major focus of our program is farmer support, which includes training of all sorts for seed savers, producers, and entrepreneurs. We're really pleased to be offering today's webinars the second in our series, Growing for Seed, the Fundamentals. The series as a whole is designed to bring our seed communities together from coast to coast, offer timely guidance and support to growers, and effectively share the knowledge and experience of folks like Linda, Jody, and John who are doing the, this work successfully across the country and the continent. Information about the series as well as recordings of past webinars is available on our website, seedsecurity.ca. So, before we get started with presentations, I'll just go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we'll be hearing from three speakers today. Each will present for 20 minutes and we'll have a 30 minute Q&A after all three have finished their presentations. For the Q&A, you can ask your question by typing it into the chat pod, which is on the bottom right of your screen. If your question is for one speaker in particular, you can say so. I'll be pulling from the pool of questions and directing them to our speakers uh, for that 30 minutes. Uh, we may or may not get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, finally, if you have thoughts about how we can improve these webinars, you can let us know. You can email me at seed at acornorganic.org. So without further ado, I'm going to get to our presenters here. So I'm going to take a second and just welcome John, who is our first presenter. John Navazio is the Senior Scientist for Organic Seed Alliance and the Extension Plant Breeding and Seed Specialist for Washington State University. John's major duties with OSA include training farmers, university students, and others in organic seed production, and the fundamentals of participatory on-farm plant breeding for organic systems. His breeding work includes increasing genetic breadth in a number of vegetable crops for their nutritional quality, flavor, texture, ability to scavenge nutrients, compete with weeds, and resist heat and drought. John develops participatory breeding projects with farmers across North America to improve crop germplasm for regional seed independence. Yeah, very good. Okay, we can start there with the uh, title slide. I have a few things to say. Perfect. Okay, hello everybody. Um, John Navazio here, and we're going to talk about uh, essentially the basic steps that are necessary to maintain varietal integrity when you're uh, growing a seed crop and how you keep the seed true to type over over a number of uh, years over generations and uh, through reproducing the seed. Uh, varietal integrity of seed propagated crops is this is the term that I use because it's so important to do selection. Seed saving is not just, is not enough. You have to do selection to both maintain and ultimately to adapt and improve the variety for your conditions. It's an ongoing process. So with that, we'll go to the first slide and launch right in here. Okay, so let's talk about the overview. Here's essentially the writing concepts that I hope to touch on in the next 20 minutes here. So you have to um, always, the, the more you understand the crop, the more you know the characteristics of the crop species in general and then specifically of the variety, the, the better equipped you are to be able to select it for the characteristics that are, that are indeed make it unique. Uh, you have to understand this breadth of the acceptable variation uh, within the variety that you're maintaining. And we'll get to that. I've got a nice picture of that, and we can talk about that specifically in a couple of minutes. Uh, you certainly have to know the reproductive characteristics of the crop so that you know that it's properly intermating and properly uh, reproducing so that you're getting the whole breadth of the 
population that you'll be growing, and I'll define population in just a moment. It's always important to select under uniform conditions and select from an adequately large population in order to have uh, basically some elbow room to keep, to keep moving and to keep it uh, healthy and pure. You do not want to baby the crop under ideal conditions. Make sure the selected individuals are tough and truly adapted to your area, but by the, by the same token, you don't want to put them under really poor conditions either, unless it's intentional in plant breeding, which is the more advanced topic for another day. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. Okay, now let's define what a crop variety is. What, what distinguishes a crop? Um, so variety is a specific term we use uh, also technically, um, scientifically, we often say cultivar, which is cultivated variety, but the, the common term that most farmers in North America use is variety, so we're going to go with that. Okay, so a variety is defined, this, and this is as good of a definition as I've been able to come up with over a number of years, so... Uh, think about this one. A group of plants of a particular species that share a set of characteristics or trait that differentiates it from other varieties of the same crop. So it must have this set of characteristics that are distinct, unique, and have to be fairly uniform across all, uh, all of the plants that are within that variety and ultimately what you'll be maintaining is a population. We'll talk about that in just a sec. Uh, so it must be, remember this, uniform, stable, stable when it's reproduced, and of course reproducible from generation to generation with those characteristics. Okay, and everybody, the beauty of this, you can come back to these definitions too in the future, because this one has uh, stood the test of time over at least 100 years now. Let's go to the next slide. Now, once you have um, a variety, then if you look to the bottom of this slide, uh, you have what scientists like to use the term phenotype, which really just means the appearance of an individual. But the phenotype, uh, phenotype is a term that's used as the expression of what the plant uh, the plant's characteristics are in a certain environment under under real world conditions. So this is really another way of saying variety in a sense, a set of observable characteristics of an individual or a group. But oftentimes we can also say the phenotype of a particular individual if it is different than the uh, population at large or than the in environment. So that's where that comes in handy and as plant breeders we use that term. But you'll see how that's important, too, here in just a second. Let's go to the next slide, please. So let's talk about, we hear the term open pollinated variety a lot, and that's a useful term when we're talking about non-hybrid varieties. Uh, so let's define that a little bit closer, because that helps us. All of this is a lead up to how do we select and keep it true to type. So to understand an open pollinated variety, you really have to understand that it is, in fact, a population in the true biological sense. So a population is simply a group of potentially, that's the important term here, potentially interbreeding individuals that are occupying a given area at the same time. In other words, a bunch of individuals, whether it's a wild animal population or a wild plant population, uh, but essentially, a, a group of creatures of that same species that have the opportunity to intermate and share genes. In other words, this is a prerequisite for what open pollinated is. That's open pollinated means plants that are able to openly pollinate and cross with others in the population. So next we'll get a little more specific with open pollinated. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so an open pollinated population uh, is defined. Now we're going to talk about it in, the, in terms of it being cr a crop variety. So trueness to type in an open pollinated variety, OP is short for open pollinated. So trueness to type 
in an OP is a statistical feature of the population as a whole. It is not a characteristic of individual plants. This is very important. We'll linger on this for just a second, and I'll also show you a, a, a picture of some carrots, a variety of carrots in a moment to explain this further. Uh, when we say, oh, that OP carrot looks like, uh, you know, it has a, a broad shoulder, it, it's um, tubular in shape, it has a uh, defined blunt uh, tip, it has certain kind of tops, uh, it is a, a color, a certain hue of, of orange, let's say, or purple. Uh, then those are all things that, that vary from individual to individual. So essentially, uh, what you're looking for, if we go to the next slide, we'll perhaps explain this a little bit better, the characteristic of the population. So then the phenotype of an OP is, in fact, an average member of the population. It is, in fact, defined as the ideal or the, as a term we sometimes now use, idea type of that particular variety. So the secret of a good OP variety, though, is how much you ver variation you allow to remain and still have it be a defined variety. Now let's, if we go to a uh, picture, I think this will explain this and I can talk about it. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a picture of rumba carrot. This is a carrot variety that we've been maintaining with a local farmer here, Nash Huber. Uh, this is a great representation of an open pollinated variety. This is 12 roots that I selected uh, a little over a year ago and took a photo of. Uh, so let's further define this OP, and then we can really talk about how to maintain a good OP. So a stable variety feeds true from seed. We know that. OPs are normally reproduced by allowing plants to openly pollinate. Already said that. That's the equivalent of this potentially interbreeding in any population. And the phenotype of this OP is an average root of this population. So let's talk about what an average is, and then we'll talk about uh, whether we get into inbreeding or whether, in fact, uh, if we select too broadly, uh, it does no longer retains the unique characteristics of the variety. So if you look at this picture, I would say the, um, uh, the ideotype or the ideal of this variety would be the four roots in the middle, right above the card that says rumba. In fact, when I selected these 12 roots, I selected 12 roots that I considered were representative of this population. Anything outside of the smallest of this or the, the broadest shouldered, if you look to the right, you'll see carrots that have a broader shoulder, a little more squat, looking a little more like a Chantenay carrot, for those of you familiar with Chantenays. Uh, and the ones on the left look uh, increasingly long, more like a bunching carrot, more like some sort of uh, Nance times an Emperor sort of sort of carrot, where the ones in the middle are, are uniquely uh, would be the ideotype of rumba. So does that mean that the four roots on the right or the four roots on the extreme left are not part of Rumba, no, it wouldn't. This is a classic open pollinated population where we're allowing that variation, the two sides of the uh, bell-shaped curve, if you will, we're allowing that much variation to stay within the variety. Whereas those four middle ones truly do uh, give you the ideal rumba phenotype as it was defined. Now, if I were taking a picture for a seed catalog, I would invariably, as a carrot breeder, I would choose the four middle ones, take a photo of that, and say, here's what rumba is really supposed to look like. Even though I've included a little bit of the odd shape there, if you can see the fifth one from the right, um, and this is truth in advertising here, but I would go for that middle group of four. In this case, I'm, I'm showing you folks as, as seed growers and as people who will maintain good open pollinated varieties, 
that in fact you cannot select too narrowly, as I say below, or you will get inbreeding depression. If you select too narrowly for the ideal ones in the middle, you'll slowly start to lose some of the strength in the shoulder that you can see more pronounced on the right, which is important for maintaining the strong shoulder of the middle carrots is to leave some of the carrots on the right in there. You will also, you will lose some of the good bluntness that's most revealed on those, at least two of those carrots on the right. And you'll start to uh, have a variety that shifts and is no longer representative of good rumba in the middle. If I don't keep some, some of the length on the left, some of the, some of the broadness and the, um, uh, the blunting on the right. Hope that makes sense. Now, if I select even more broadly than this and essentially just save seed from everything that comes up every generation, then at, at some point after a very short order, actually, in a couple generations, I will have a variety that is not as distinct for that middle idea type of rumba. I hope this makes sense. And of course, you folks can come back to this as it will be posted. Let's go on to the next slide for now. And talk about how we do this. Sorry, there's a phone in my office here. Okay, now we're going to start with the trial to determine which is the best strain of the variety of interest. So uh, it's very important if you're doing um, any kind of maintenance of older standard varieties. Let's talk about beets for a second, perhaps. Um, Something like a Detroit dark red beet is a great example. There are at least uh, a dozen um, different strains of Detroit dark red out in the marketplace. So before, if, if you deemed Detroit dark red as a good variety, uh, worthy of saving seed, and in fact it was bred in southern Ontario originally for the Detroit market, but over the, over the Detroit River there on the Ontario side, good old southern... Canada variety, um, I would want to look at at least every strain of that variety that I could in a trial to determine which was the best one, most, the best suited for my uh, conditions before I started selecting. So let's go to that next slide. I mean, the next, yeah, the next slide will give us the next line. So this initial evaluation needs to be a good enough trial so you can see a fairly decent number of those beet roots to detect the presence of off types or detect just whether any of those strains of Detroit dark red are not adequate. Let's go to that next slide. And we'll define off types in just a moment. Always start with a large enough population to allow opportunity to cross. So after you've run a trial, and even from your initial trial, if you've grown enough uh, beets or carrots, you can then, in fact, select from that uh, en enough roots to carry that variety on. Let's go to the next one. I think the next slide, please. It's coming here. Here we go. So, uh, in general, cross-pollinated crops need larger population. Whoops, we blew past that last one. Could we go back one, please? I was sure. just reading the bottom of that last one. Yeah, I had said it twice. Uh, Cross-pollinated crops need larger populations to avoid inbreeding depression. This is uh, information you can read about in the book that I published, Organic Seed Grower. It's also uh, referenced in some of our organic seed, seed saving material for Organic Seed Alliance, which you can easily find at seedalliance.org. Um, Self-pollinated crops require smaller populations uh, as they do not get inbreeding depression is readily. Now, we'll just talk about numbers a little bit in the time we have remaining, but for further reading, I would encourage you to go a little bit deeper in learning about why crossers need big populations and selfers require smaller ones. Let's go to the next slide now, please, Steph. Okay, what are off types? Off types in most varieties are often simply variants outside of the acceptable average phenotype for that variety. So you have to be on the lookouts. Whenever you're reproducing a variety, you have to ask yourself first, are there so many off types that this is not a very good strain of this variety to begin with? And perhaps there's a better strain available. 
or do I just, is there, well, there's some off types, but I can select them out in my normal selection and reproduction phase. Let's go to that next slide, please. So off types occur in three basic ways. Just want to mention these quickly. You'll all be able to come back and think about this later as well. But there are naturally occurring genetic variants that always come up. People are very um, skeptical of how much new genetic variation exists every time you grow a crop. But in my experience, new, new variants occur quite frequently. So you have to be on the lookout for them. Sometimes they can be good gems that you can start a new variety with, and sometimes they're just undesirable. You want to get them out of the variety. They're too much out of that, uh, that idea type that we're looking for. The other thing that can happen that cr create off types is you can get outcrosses from the previous generation where you will have um, unwanted crosses with another, in this case, if we're talking beets, another beet variety. So you have to be on the lookout for those. They're often very obvious. Lastly, there can be seed mixes, seed mixes, sorry, seed mixes happen naturally from harvest, from harvesting the seed to cleaning it, especially if you're cleaning it in seed cleaning equipment. Uh, you can get seeds stuck in nooks and crannies that will show up in the next batch that you clean. Uh, so you'll mix batch A to batch B, very bad business, and people who are good at this spend a lot of time cleaning out, whether it's their machinery or even just their desktop or wherever they're cleaning the seed. You have to be immaculate between lots of the same variety. Uh, many different, and question mark means many different ways that you can get seed mixes. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. And I'm coming down on my last few minutes here. So this is a nice summary slide um, to show you uh, some of the basic concepts. And again, uh, if you're like me, you'll come back to this repeatedly and think about it, but I'll give you all of the basics here so you know how to read this uh, very nice chart that was started by Jared Zeistro, my colleague here at Organic Seed Alliance, and he and I have been adding and tweaking it. It is not, uh, it is a work in progress, let's say. There's no exact way to do any of this, but let me talk about a little of it to show you the, the point that Jared first brilliantly thought of, which is the Essentially, with seed crops, we are talking about a continuum. Selfers, if you read in the literature often, self-pollinated crops and cross-pollinated crops, when you're saving seed from them, are often put into two distinct categories. We don't see it that way. The extremely um, um, efficient selfers that are very true to type and very rarely cross, those would be represented on the left side of this multicolored bar in the center. Peas, for instance, uh, soybeans, another good example, edamame, uh, very true to type and very little outcrossing um, from generation to generation. Hence, there's two different bits of information that you can read from this. The crops that are very, um, true to self-pollination and rarely outcross, need very little isolation distance. So on the top of the bar is showing you isolation distance between varieties of that crop to stay pure. If you get to lettuce, lettuce crosses a little bit more than peas in our experience. If you start to get to tomatoes, even modern tomatoes, uh, they cross a little bit more than even lettuce. So you can see we're slowly shifting from the left where they're almost entirely self-pollinated to the right where they're at first insect pollinated and insects will cross your tomatoes. You, you, you really do need 20 feet of isolation between even the more modern type of slicing tomatoes than you do uh, once you get into heirloom tomatoes and the so-called potato leaf tomatoes. You really start getting into more like 50 feet of isolation. You get into uh, sweet peppers, it's more like 50 to 60 feet of isolation. You get into um, you get into something like hot peppers, then we're going we're talking hot peppers cross quite readily and insects are are very um, important part of the biology of hot peppers. So you we increase radically to 500 feet. I know that seems radical. 
radical to most people. I also apologize for not having this in meters for you folks. That's the next step in this evolving thing is to put it uh, both in meters as well as feet. Uh, so once we get into the crops that are solidly insect pollinated, like squash, brassicas, umbelliferae, apiaceae, uh, then you need at least a mile isolation. And once we're up to the wind pollinated, uh, such as the amaranths, uh, what we're now calling the chenopodiaceae, the beets and spinach, for instance, which are wind pollinated, corn certainly wind pollinated, then we're recommending uh, two miles there for isolation. Now, uh, just so you know, so we can read the bottom thing, and this is what Jared and I believed was so powerful here, is that in fact this the amount of crossing is very instructive in the number of plants you need to in fact have healthy populations. So um, uh, peas, lettuce, uh, if you have a very um, uniform variety, if you're starting with a uniform variety, and I'll mention that in my very last slide, which is coming up, I've only got a minute or two remaining here, uh, then uh, very low number of plants and you can have an acceptable maintenance of that crop because the number of plants is very important in order to make sure you capture the, the inherent variation of the crop. So as we move to the right and as, we, as the crops are more readily crossed, there is usually more inherent genetic variation there. So we have to increase these numbers. Here you can see at 500 feet and with hot peppers, I'm a strong believer, and you need to have maintain at least um, 40 or 50 uh, individual plants of a hot pepper uh, in order to maintain its good genetic variation. Uh, squash and cucumbers are also are often uh, melons as well. Are the case is made that they can be maintained with fewer plants. I still really like to have them in at least the 20 to 40 range to maintain variation. And I realize size can be a problematic thing there. I discuss that more in my book, and we'll be discussing that more in some future uh, publications we're doing at OSA. So watch for that. Uh, once you get to all the way over to corn, I'll just suffice to say here, I'm running out of time. We'll go to the next slide. But corn, once you're to corn, all of the corn people contend that if you don't have 200 corn plants, you have... In fact, you have really um, hurt the variety. So hopefully you can read that in the future and get more out of that. Now, here's our final population size slide in the final slide of my talk. Less than populations, less than 20 plants in a population is okay in selfers if the variety is stable and uniform. If it's an old-fashioned selfer, a lettuce perhaps, or uh, endive or escarole that's, uh, that's got a lot of um, inherent variation, then you might want to really consider keeping more than 20 plants. Why? The common sense thing is you might want to retain that genetic, inherent genetic variation while still, of course, selecting to this uh, stability of uniformity. Now, in crossers, I recommend across the board just 80 to 100 plants minimum is very important because you want to have um, you want to avoid inbreeding depression and you want to be able to maintain genetic diversity and that adaptive resilience um, through the generations uh, also we almost always recommend that anyone planting any seed crop plants at least twice as many plants at the beginning of their seed growing exercise so that they can end up with this as their final numbers is what we recommend. These are the final numbers to really have genetic resiliency. So, because, in fact, you always have to plan on loss of plants or um, their inability to flower or uh, complete failure to flowering or abnormal flowering or something that's obviously a poor reproductive uh, characteristic as well as if they're off types or they're not suitable to the variety. And uh, when we're talking about any kind of overwintering crop where you have stored it in a root cellar or if you're lucky enough to be able to grow it out, out of doors as we are here on the Pacific Coast in southern BC, 
then of course you're going to um, uh, you're going to still lose some over winter, and you will get some that die from disease or other attrition. So always account for those losses due to selection as well. I know we'll have some questions at the very end, so I will be here for those questions at the end. And thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been worthy of our time together. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, John, for joining us and sharing that with us. Uh, we will look forward to getting a little bit more in depth uh, after all of the presentations have concluded. Just bear with me. I'm going to switch modes here so that we can hear from our next presenter. So Linda Gilkison earned her PhD in entomology from McGill University in 1986, then moved to British Columbia to work for a company that produces biological controls. For 10 years, she worked for the BC government, promoting programs to reduce and eliminate pesticide use. In the past, she has co-authored government pest management training manuals and organic gardening books for Rodale Press. She currently has three books in print, including her self-published West Coast Gardening, Natural Insect, Weed, and Disease Control. Linda now devotes her time to writing, teaching, and consulting, and is a regular instructor in the Master Gardener programs in BC. For more on her publications, you can visit www.lindagilkison.ca. All right, so your presentation is loading up now. Linda, you can take it away. Um, okay, welcome everyone. Um, what I'm going to do is an overview of a way of thinking about managing pests and with a definite slant to the needs of um, pest management in seed crops. And I will be touching on disease as well, but Jody, uh, who follows me, is going to go in much greater depth on seed-borne diseases. And so I will, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be just putting it into a broader framework. So let me just go down here one. So the first thing um, is to look at this framework. It's, it's really the integrated pest management steps. It's, it's a way of thinking about any kind of pest problem. And the first one is prevention. What can I do to avoid the problem or problems? And uh, the next one is very, very important is correct identification. Do you know exactly what a problem is? Um, the third, well, real step in this process is monitoring, which means looking. When, where, what are we looking for? Um, and then an understanding of injury or damage levels. Is damage really occurring? Do you need to do anything? And that's different from just finding a pest problem. This is like, do you really have a problem that you have to deal with? The treatment toolbox, what are the least toxic controls in the toolbox? There's lots of things that you, we do have available. And then the last step that people might forget is the evaluation step is how did it go and that's how you plan for prevention next year. Um, now, to, to, I can't emphasize enough that correct diagnosis is essential. You're, you're really kind of dead in the water if you don't know what the problem is. And just to give us a bit of a sober look at this, most plant damage occurs from disorders such as deficiencies or, or injury cold injury, uh, temperature extremes, uh, poor irrigation practice, too wet, too dry. Most damage that gets sent into um, plant diagnostic labs, um, they, they turn out not to be insects or disease. Um, in fact, I think the lab at WSU, uh, Washington State University, says it's about 70% um, of the plant injury is, is due to some, uh, plant uh, problems is due to some sort of disorder. So. Don't panic when you see something. Now, the next thing is that if you suspect it is a plant disease, they are difficult to identify, and that's really where you need help with your local diagnostic lab, your university or Ministry of Agriculture lab, depending where you are. Um, you've got to find out the species, and once you know, then there's quite a bit of information available about life cycle, biology, um, thinking about how to prevent problems, different kinds of controls, and, and also when it comes to insects, the natural enemies, which once you're familiar with those, you can determine whether there's enough of them in the field to give you the adequate level of control that might be necessary. And you can see some of the photos. Um, it, it, people that can't see the photos right now can log in. I've labeled them just some pretty peculiar looking injuries that um, 
showing you the range of problems, this terrible looking mess with the tomatoes and peppers is actually a calcium deficiency, even though it looks like disease. These pockmarked um, damaged cabbage leaf is hail damage. And then there's some um, uh, garlic that was given to me as being absolutely certain it was white rot, and it's not. It's probably bit botrytis neck rot. So um, don't panic. <laughs> the next slide shows that really, if you can see the insect, if you can see insects during the day in your garden or in your field, they're probably not pests. Just about the only pest insect that's out there during the day is the white cabbage butterfly. Everything else is, um, um, Steph, are you moving the slides around here? Yeah. Uh, nope. Not me either. Some, maybe somebody else has got control. That's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Feel free to just jump in there it. and correct it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, just be aware that just because you see things flying around out there, they are not necessarily pests. In fact, most insects are not pests. Now, when it comes to monitoring for the problem, what to look for, well, this monitoring is close inspection. Now, the, you know, the better job you do in terms of looking and keeping records, the, the, uh, the better pest management program you'll be able to put together. So close inspection for pests, yes, of course, but they're hard to see. But damage, signs of disease, um, you may need you, you need to do it regularly, but only um, at the time that the problem is there. If you know that you're inspecting for spinach leaf miner, then and I've got a picture on the screen here of spinach leaf miner eggs. If you know when you're inspecting for that, then there's a couple two to three generations a year, and you just need to watch during those periods of time when they're available. And keep notes, um, photographs, sampling records. Um, take some specimens, maybe um, press leaves, bring, uh, put insects into the freezer to kill them, and then you've got a specimen that will actually keep quite well once it's taken out and dried and uh, get it identified. So the monitoring tells you whether a problem is getting better or getting worse. Very often we see problems after the insect particularly that made the problem or made the damage has left the plant. So by watching that plant, we can tell whether the problem is uh, uh, continuing or not. It also tells you, our inspections are going to tell you when to treat. If you're going to use a bacterial spray for caterpillars, then the caterpillars have to be there present and at the right size to eat it. And it also gives you information about when to look for the problem next year. Write it on the calendar, look for it a little earlier, catch it a little earlier. Okay. Hmm, this is very strange. The, uh, somebody's got control of this slide set. That's all right. When to take action should be the next slide that uh, people are seeing. And that is going to depend on the size of the plants, the kind of damage, and whether you can find natural enemies present. Um, and just think about this. A, a tiny little seedling will be killed by a cutworm but a very large cabbage plant with diamondback moth, and I have a picture here in the corner, um, suffers so little from their injury that it really doesn't matter how many there are out there unless there's just a devastating population. So the priorities for seed crops are really different from, from people harvesting crops for food. Of low concern for seed crop people are the cosmetic damage, the thrips, a lot of leaf chewers, sap suckers, and even some leaf diseases are not very much concerned because they don't uh, alter the appearance um, or ability of the plant to set seed. The only really, the, the, the time when this kind of injury can matter is when it obscures some of the characteristics that John mentioned that you want to check or include in your, your um, base as far as genetic characteristics. So if it's, the injury is so bad that it's obscured something about the, the genetic characteristics of the plant that you want to preserve, then that's, um, then that's a possibility that you may need to treat. The greatest concern are the organisms that kill or severely stunt the plants. And I gave you the cutworm example. Root maggots can stunt plants very variably in a, in a field so that you're not sure whether you're looking at genetic variation or root injury or not. Wireworms do the same thing. 
um, late blight kills plants, club root of cabbage stunts and kills. So there's a number of things that are important. Seed eaters, where people have pea moth or birds that are attacking seeds, of course that's your crops, so that's important. And seed-borne diseases are crucial for um, people that are going to be selling or giving seeds um, to other growers. And Jody's going to talk a lot more about that. When you've decided that you do have a problem and you want to choose treatments, there's quite a toolbox of non-toxic uh, methods, um, cultural, physical, biological controls, and, and a few least toxic or low toxic chemicals such as soap. Now, the thing to remember about all of these treatments, though, is that they are most of them only work on specific pests or diseases. They are not broad spectrum. That is why they are, in fact, useful as non-toxic or least toxic controls. Um, some of them depend on very careful timing to be effective, which means knowing the biology of the pest or disease that you're looking in that you want to manage. And um, it's very often that you'll need to do several several things at once, and the, the greatest impact is when they are used in combinations, and uh, that's when you can really get a high level of control if you need need to do it. And the image on the screen just shows water sprays controlling aphids and powdery mildew. So that's my favorite non-toxic control, I think. <laughs> um, this, the next slide is on cultural methods, and just some examples again. This is um, because of the nature of going across a country with so many different climates and so many different crops and different uh, pest problems. I've only given examples here, so I'm not going into any great depth on any of these. But crop rotation is effective in, in um, preventing the buildup of disease or pathogens that have a soil-borne um, overwintering or dormant stage. It is also a way to avoid root maggot buildup um, in mustard, carrot, onion family crops. But it won't do anything much for leaf diseases if they don't have a soil stage or soil dwelling insects that attack a wide range. Like, well, oh dear, I've got slugs under soil dwelling insects. That's a bit of a typo. But wireworms and cutworms, which attack um, a very wide host range, are not really affected by crop rotation. Sanitation is any time that you can remove disease inoculum or overwintering sites, whether it's for insects or diseases, then that's, a, that's a, an effective step. In, to achieve the, a necessary level of control um, for a seed crop, it's often sufficient uh, for some pests to just plant late enough to avoid attack. Out here on the west coast, and actually they're quite across the con continent, is the large yellow underwing moth, which has and the caterpillar is a climbing cutworm, and it is devastating over the winter and in the early spring until the insects, till these caterpillars uh, pupate. And it's a ridiculously hardy caterpillar. Um, I've chipped it out of frozen ice on pavement before <laughs> and had it thaw out and run around a jar. Um, so once they pupate, the damage stops immediately. So planting in April can be wiped out. Planting in May, no problem, because the insects are just not there to eat. Um, some late planting, when, when certain insects overwinter as adults, uh, flea beetles, Colorado potato beetle, um, some um, of these can be avoided simply by planting late enough that when the adults come out of overwintering, they've sort of wandered off and, and dispersed and are not in high concentrations in your field. Wireworms also can be sometimes avoided, uh, the majority of damage, by planting late enough that the soil is warm. They go, um, they move through the soil column. They're in the soil column for several years, depending on the species, and they move up and down through the soil column, depending on temperature. So in the winter, they go deep. In the spring, they come up to the surface. In the summer, they go deep. And then in the fall, they come back up to the surface. And um, when they're up at the surface, they're doing more damage than when they're deeper and, and feeding on finer root hairs. Some examples of physical controls, and again, this just examples, um, just simply removing insects, eggs, disease tissue. Um, that's a pretty standard, just walking through a field, walking through your garden. Water sprays are a good physical control, knocking off, of, knocking off aphids, spider mites, thrips. Um, also suppressing powdery mildews, and that group of fungi um, don't germinate or cannot germinate when there's free water on the leaf, and so it actually suppresses that particular fungus. 
traps and trap crops um, are, are hard to manage, but people have done successful work with um, attracting wireworms to rows of sprouting grain away from a crop. Um, cabbage flea beetles are very much more attracted to the leaf mustards than to broccoli, and so sometimes mustard can be used as a uh, attractant away from a crop if you're saving broccoli for seeds, broccoli seed. Barriers are always um, a really effective option, but they're not cheap. On the other hand, if you're using barriers, and I'm talking about things like the floating row covers or insect mesh, if you are covering uh, rows of crops for seed to, to preserve or to prevent insect cross pollen, you know, insects from um, moving pollen from different varieties, if you're, if you're using that anyway, then using the size of mesh that will prevent the insects uh, from attacking the plants, you're kind of a two for one. You're getting two benefits out of one. Um, in, in, it's a compatible practice. Again, it's not a cheap practice. On, this, on the uh, slide, I have listed a source in Canada for a um, knitted monofilament netting that is very sturdy. And it is from Protect, it's called Protect Net. It's not the only insect mesh around if you're protecting for um, keeping insects off of crops. There, there, there are others, but that happens to be a Canadian distri distributor. And one other uh, uh, mention in the root maggot barriers that I've showing, I've got a picture on the lower corner of the slide, simply placing a barrier on the soil at the time of uh, transplanting out, if it fits very tightly around the stem, can be a manual or a, or a physical barrier to enough root maggots, it doesn't stop them all um, from a, attack that the crop can be perfectly um, adequate. On a field scale, of course, root maggots this may not make much sense, but people will use um, uh, continuous cultivation to leave heap up dry soil around the plants and thus make a uh, very unfriendly habitat for insects laying leaves, laying eggs on, le uh, on, the, on the soil. Now, the, the last really segment of this is about applying or, or using biological control on the farm. And uh, this is where organic farms are, are, you know, often miles ahead because they already have a diversity of crops. Uh, they're not using uh, broad spectrum insecticides. A lot of planting practices are conducive to protecting these thousands of native insects. And I have a slide here just showing you a few species of the thousands that just eat aphids alone. So that picture, remember, is just for aphids, and there are predators on all kinds of caterpillars and other pests, including uh, soil-dwelling pests. So how do we make the most of the natural enemies that are already out there? Well, first, avoiding any kind of pesticide use, and people sometimes are, are shocked when I put soap in this category. Soap will kill those insects as fast as anything else will. So even if it seems like it's supposed to be approved for organic growers to use, it doesn't mean that it's um, safe for the beneficial insects by any means. Um, a chief way that we can take advantage of all of these insects that are already out there is to attract them and feed them. Um, the adult stages of, for example, the ones that were on the previous slide, but most of these aphid predators, the adults eat pollen or nectar. It is only the, it's the immature stage of the insects that actually attack or parasitize the aphids. So by attracting the, uh, or by, by providing food that the adult needs, you attract the female ready to lay eggs into your area, and she um, has her meal, and she can lay eggs, and uh, the first place she'll look to lay eggs is where she has her food. And I have a little series of slides here, a series of photos here showing um, a greenhouse, um, a situation, a home greenhouse, simply by moving um, some plants that were attractive to hoverflies into the greenhouse and opening the doors and windows. Um, the pepper crop, which was covered with aphids, that's the second slide, has eggs laid um, by the surface flies on it. And the third, third picture shows, uh, the, the, in the yellow circle, it's the same leaf as in the previous picture, but it's um, completely devoid of aphids and there are only two big fat hoverfly larvae left. So what kind of plants can we use? Well, the next slide shows um, some examples. Now this is obviously, you're going to be choosing plants that do not cross with your seed crops. 
but there's quite a lot of different plants to choose from. And one of my all-time favorites is sweet alyssum, and it's not likely that you would have anything that that would be a concern in crossing with anyway. But um, the whole um, uh, carrot family, dill, cilantro, parsley, also yarrow, um, are very attractive to lady beetles and lacewings and a lot of aphid predators. Sweet alyssum is, is good to bring in many aphid predators and also um, quite a lot of the species of parasitic wasps that attack caterpillars. Uh, pollen sources, calendula, daisies, goldenrod, these are good. The best plants are in the mustard, carrot, mint, aster families and also weeds. And so that's, again, something you'll need to be careful about when you're choosing your plants. Um, for crossing with seeds, but I'll just tell you that um, sweet alyssum is, is used commercially in California. It, I mean, it has been for years as an interplant for commercial lettuce because it is so attractive to aphid predators that they will get in and control the aphids in the commercial field uh, well enough to provide clean enough lettuce for, for sale because you can't really get at aphids that are down inside the, 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 the lettuce leaves. Now my last, uh, almost my next, my next to the last slide here is uh, pesticides. And they're always the last resort. Um, I would imagine that for most seed crops, you would never get this far because between attracting beneficials or just realizing that something doesn't need to be treated, I think the majority of problems can be dealt with. Um, there are a range of products, botanical and plant-based ones, the pyrethrins um, in the U.S., neem, uh, and essential oils are more common in the U.S. We have microbial products, the BTK or Bacillus thuringiensis, which is uh, in Canada, just the, the one we have is just for caterpillars. The, a, new, a new product, uh, or at least newly available at the domestic level, is Bacillus subtilis, and uh, that is the product called Serenade, that's the, the brand name, um, for m quite a variety of leaf diseases. And uh, there's some real potential there. Spinosad is not available domestically, but it is also, it is used commercially in Canada for organic uh, production. Under the chemicals, we have soap, oil, iron-based slug bait, sulfur, bicarbonates, um, quite a range there. And then a few inerts like kale and clay and diatomaceous earth. Now, kale and clay is sprayed on it, things like apples, so not really seed crops that I can think of. And diatomaceous earth is um, it's real dangerous in a garden for the point of view of the beneficial insects. It, it cuts any insect that gets it on it is at risk of dying. So it, to me, it's not really an appropriate outdoor product. And I guess the bottom line that I'd really like everybody to remember, if it kills pests or pathogens, it can also um, be harmful to beneficials. So my last slide is just a review. Again, thinking, you know, think about your pest problems in this structure. Prevention, what can you do to avoid the problem? Identification, that means really you have to know what the problem is. Monitoring, keep an eye on it, keep good records. Um, think about the injury or damage level, and the real question is, damage really occurring? And do you really need to do anything? And then when, you, when it comes to treatment, what are the least toxic controls? And evaluation, do not forget to evaluate um, how it went and then figure out what you can do for next season. And that's my, that's my, that's my slides. Okay, fabulous. Thank you so much, Linda, for that really thorough presentation. I'll introduce our third and final speaker for today. Jody Lou Smith earned her PhD in plant biology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's the Director of Research and Development for High Mowing Seeds. She joined the seed company in 2003 as the seed disease specialist. At High Mowing, she first established a seed testing laboratory for evaluating germination rates, seed health, and diagnostic consultation on plant diseases. From there, she established and now oversees their plant breeding program, which focuses on development of varieties that do well in organic production systems, have unique combinations of traits, and are selected primarily for flavor, quality, and reliability. All right, so that's dialing up now, Jody, and you can take it away. I recognize a lot of you. I recognize a lot of names in this participant list. So uh, greetings to everybody who I have met at various conferences. 
And um, thank you for inviting me to be here to talk about this um, fascinating topic today. Um, and so this, I, I, given the short length of the talk, I'm just going to focus on a few crops. I'm going to do a little intro um, on the basics of seedborne disease, um, the actual organisms that cause the diseases. And then I'm just going to go through just a couple, a few crops. I tried to pick the ones that I thought would be most relevant for um, folks in Canada. And then um, mostly I just have some resources at the end. So um, I'm going to talk about seedborne disease from the perspective of organics, because that's what we do most and I know best. And the real basic tenet for organics is to really focus on prevention. Because we have such a limited toolbox, um, preventing disease is really our best strategy and we treat as a last resort. In many cases, once we have a disease, there really isn't a treatment. So knowledge ahead of time is usually our very best strategy. Um, and I don't think I say it elsewhere. I'll say it here while I'm thinking of it. Regarding prevention, really, plants could do a lot of their own disease prevention if they have all the nutrients that they need and a really you know a really robust nutrient management system is your best prevention method for disease um, so if when we are talking about diseases pathogens come in three different flavors that are really very different from each other um, bacteria um, are systemic meaning they ride through the veins of the plant and that means that they're treatable, but really only from inside the seed. They're not so treatable in the field. Unlike fungi, which tend to be on the surface of both plants and of, on seed, um, making them somewhat treatable in fields, but less so on seed. They can be interior to seed or on the surface, either one. And viruses, which also are systemic like bacteria, are not treatable anywhere. They Pretty much, uh, once they're in there, they're in there. So just a minute about bacteria. Um, just a little background for those who've forgotten their high school biology. Um, basically, they're very simple cells with very soft walls. They have to stay moist all the time, which is the reason that they live inside of plants. They don't reside on the, out on the exterior of the leaf because they would dry up there. They have to stay inside. It means that they're very hard to treat in the field, but they um, are very easy to treat inside the seed. Well, not easy to treat, but they can be treated inside the seed because they're more sensitive to heat. And this is what um, this slide of the Petri plate on the right shows you what a bacteria actually looks like on a plate with many, many millions of individual cells. And that is the bacteria that causes black rot, which I'm going to talk about. Fungi are much more complex cells than bacteria. Um, they have a hard cell wall that allows them to dry out. Uh, they tend to spread by spores. They colonize the outside of plants in the field. And that means that they're easier to set back because you can spray things on the surface. Um, whether they get into the seed, a lot of that has to do with timing. If they are affecting the plant very early in the season, chances of them getting into the seed are very high. If a plant, a seed, crop is getting fungus late in the season, especially if it's coming up potentially from the soil, it doesn't necessarily always get into the seed. The seed pod can be up and above the fungal disease and you won't have any problem. So the earlier it gets on the crop, the more damage you're going to have. Uh, the more you wait, you know, late season fungal diseases, if they're, if they're on the pods or on fruit, they can be a problem, but they can affect plants without affecting the seed. Viruses are a whole different thing. They're more different. They're much, uh, bacteria and funguses are more like one another than either one is like a virus. Uh, there's no cells on a virus. They're not really alive, so you can't really kill them. To kill a virus, you basically have to use very high levels of pressure and heat, which would kill your seed. So you can't stop them in the field. You can't treat them on your seed. They're not as devastating in a field as bacteria or fungi. and some of them are not at all seed borne. So you can have occasionally have viruses in a crop that aren't really a problem. You just have to figure out what kind of virus it is. Um, but in most cases, you don't want viruses to travel on your seed. And there are a number that do. And so your best, your best strategy in many cases is to detect before you plant 
because many times it has come with um, your viruses have come from your seed if it's a seed-borne virus. Okay, so what do I need to worry about? I'm going to talk today about really the, what I call the red alert diseases. These are the really problematic diseases for seed crops. They're, either, they're highly virulent, meaning they will spread through a whole field and kill everything, um, and they're highly seed-borne. So they they have everything wrong going for them, and I'm going to focus on those today. I'm also going to mention a few orange alert diseases. These can be one of two kinds. They can be ones that, that are moderately destructive, but very highly seed-borne, or they can be very destructive, but only moderately seed-borne. Yellow alert diseases are really just ones that you see on seed. They're very common, but they're not um, significantly seed born and they're not something you need to primarily worry about as a seed grower and I'm not going to talk about any of those today. So luckily there's only a small handful of the red alert diseases and I'm just going to talk about the most common ones and those most relevant for seed production. Um, in brassica, so now I'm going to I'm going to talk about crops separately and I'm going to start with the brassica crops all of which get the same diseases and the two, clearly two worst of them, are black rot and black leg. Black rot is a, is, sorry, is a bacteria and black leg is a fungus. They actually have fairly similar patterns, but they're two very different organisms. Um, Barassica black rot is a bacteria. That's the one we saw in the Petri plate early on. Um, it's highly virulent and highly seedborne. It's pretty much the worst of the seedborne diseases. Um, it spreads very quickly in warm, wet weather. Uh, the only good things about it are that there is now a strip test available that you can buy for testing your seed before you plant it so that you're not accidentally planting it in your field. Um, it is sensitive to hot water treatment. Bacteria, as I said, are much more sensitive than fungi. So you can um, preventively hot water treat seed, um, but again, your best, your best strategy is always going to be prevention. Um, in a way, back, uh, black rot, it's, because it's so highly virulent, it's not very common because it tends to kill plants before they ever make seed. So your more virulent, your more virulent seed-borne diseases are only traveling on seed when they have the situation of coming into a seed field late in the, late in the game, late in the season. If they come in early, they kill everything. So it's only when they come in late and get on that seed crop at the very last stages that they then travel with the seed. Um, as I think we saw another picture earlier, but this is um, very distinctive, very much um, in these leaf margins. And they just have this really, that's one, another nice thing about black rot is you don't have to worry too much, wonder too much whether or not you have it because it's very distinctive. Um, this is its typical look on a cabbage, right at those vein, the leaf margins, primarily at the veins. Okay, moving on to the fungus blackleg. Um, it has two Latin names. Um, it is the number two uh, problem seedborne disease for brassicas. It too is highly virulent and highly seedborne. It spreads in the same kind of weather in which black rot spreads, but it's not as common or as explosive as black rot. Um, it too will kill its host, so it only spreads when it comes late into a seed crop. And it is also sensitive to hot water treatment, but like black rot, you don't want to take any chances with either of these. If you had these on your crop and late in a season, you wouldn't want to save any seed from those. Here's some symptoms of black leg. Um, it has a really distinctive canker on the stems. Um, it could be on the stem, sometimes it could be at the very base of the stems, and they always have that black pycnidia, which is really characteristic of fungi within the cankers. Here's a few more symptoms. Um, they will eventually, it will eventually, it usually typically starts in the stem, but will eventually make spots on the leaves. Uh, very, also very distinctive. Okay, moving on to the lettuce as a crop. Um, lettuce has only one really problematic seedborne disease. It has many other diseases, but they don't tend to be seedborne. The one that's seedborne is LMV, lettuce mosaic virus. You've probably all been familiar with this one because it's so common. Um, it's red alert because it's highly virulent, highly seedborne. Um, it's especially common on the West Coast. Um, 
somebody else will have to tell me whether it's uh, common on the west coast of Canada. It's very common on the west coast in the U.S. Um, it spreads by insects mainly, but also by seed. Um, it spreads throughout the field mainly by leaf hoppers. Um, it's not particularly deadly. It won't destroy a whole crop. It will basically make it unmarketable. And there are some regions of the country where low, low levels can be tolerable because it it doesn't um, at low levels, it won't even necessarily show up as symptoms. Here's a typical look at it. Um, very difficult to tell from CMV in the fields, but again, there's strip tests that show it very clearly. Um, this is what an up-close leaf would look like. And that is the LMV story. I'm going to move on to tomato as a crop. Um, almost every single farmer Vegetable farmer and seed grower will do tomatoes at some point or another, and tomato happens to have a number of seed-borne diseases. Um, the worst of them is tomato mosaic virus. It's a very similar pathogen to lettuce mosaic virus in a lot of ways. And then there's this suite of bacterial diseases that I characterize as orange alert because none of them are as seed-borne or as virulent, but they're all very similar to each other, and I'll show you pictures of the three of them. Starting with mosaic virus, this is again a red alert. Um, it's the same virus as tobacco mosaic virus, meaning you can get it from smoking. It can be on the hands of smokers, and it can spread very quickly among plug trays um, throughout a field. So it's something to be very aware of as a seed grower, that you need to make your crew very aware that smoking and tomato crops are a really bad combination. Um, it also comes from seed very commonly, and again, it can be tested for with a strip test ahead of planting, which is very, we do that now for all of our, all of our tomato seed crops. Um, the commercial damage, again, can, can range from being very light to very heavy, um, but it's very hard to get out of seed. Once you have it in your seed field, you basically have to just pull up those plants. Um, here's some symptoms. Um, it's rare that you'll see it on the fruit. Usually, you'll see it on the leaves, and by the time it would have made fruit, you will have pulled up that plant. Okay, moving on to this suite of bacterial diseases. Um, the first, uh, they're all three bacteria. Uh, one is a canker, one is a spot, and one is a speck. They're all um, both can be anywhere from highly to moderately virulent, but they're all pretty highly seed borne. Um, they cause the most damage in greenhouses. And they are eradicated from seed by either fermentation and or hot water treatment. So there is some tolerance for very low levels because you're, you can treat them twice, essentially, by fermenting and then by hot water. And I'm going to just do a quick look at the symptoms. As a seed grower, it's not as important to necessarily know which one you have as much as to know that you do have a bacterial disease. But it is worthwhile always to know, if you can, what you have. And bacterial canker is the most distinctive. It has these bird's eye type spots that look almost like scale. Um, bacterial spot has larger raised spots. And it's the only one of the three that does infect green fruit. Um, and it has a, that, that distinctive raised look. The speck is smaller. It is just what it's called, the speck. Um, and they're much shallower. And here's what the three of them look like together on a slide. Um, the spots on the fruit is the most distinctive feature because on the stem and the leaf, the symptoms are similar to each other and also similar to several other tomato diseases that are not seed borne. So the fruit symptoms are pretty are the most distinctive. OK, so those are the only, uh, I'm done talking about crops in particular. But uh, I want to talk a minute about what happens when you find any kind of disease in your seed crop because there's some several different, there's a, there's a clear um, path of um, action here. The first is knowledge. Uh, first is, you know, knowing which ones are seed borne, then careful, carefully looking for crop among your crops to spot symptoms. And then this, this third one is really your most important one, is confirming your diagnosis. Linda talked about this too, that it's really very important to know what you've got. And almost, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the system is um, for Canada, but there's almost always some a government agency that will help you get a clear diagno diagnosis on your symptoms. Um, 
And then once you know what it is, you'll consult with your seed company and determine what you're going to do. Um, so the first scenario is that it's not a seed-borne disease. So all you need to do in this case is keep your um, apply treatment or whatever else you need to do to keep your plants alive. And an example would be late blight. Very much not seed-borne, but will destroy your crop. So you can treat with um, whatever you are allowed to use to keep your plants alive, and you can harvest that seed. The next scenario would be a low virulence disease, and your seed could be treated. Um, it may be harvested and flagged for hot water treatment. Um, some of the bacterial spot diseases I talked about in tomato or in pepper could be in this category. There are some cucurbit diseases that would fall into this category. They're often things that are more soil borne, but they can travel on seed. For these, um, you can occasionally treat the seed and you would go ahead and harvest that crop. That's that's kind of the exception to the rule. That doesn't happen very often. Um, in general, though, if you have, for most seed-borne diseases, you would typically destroy your crop as soon as you confirm your diagnosis. You don't want to spend any more time on that crop and then have um, a seed company test the seed and reject it. You don't want to spend more, you know, you don't want to spend more time and the seed company doesn't want to spend more time on it. Um, there are some treatments for disease eradication, and I'm just going to talk about these really quickly. Hot water and bleach are the two primary ones for organics. Um, hot water uh, has advantage of being by far the more effective. It works very well. It kills disease on both the inside and the outside of the seed. That's its really powerful strategy. And it can fully eradicate the pathogens that are heat sensitive, and it has no residue. There's also now a suite of um, experiments going on with people using steam and heat uh, that's not wet heat, um, and those treatments are coming along. They're not fully developed yet, but they're gonna we're gonna see those come through as available within the next five years, I would guess. Um, the disadvantages of hot water is that you do have to invest in some equipment. You have to be very careful not to damage the seed because if it gets too hot, it will die. Um, and you can't do it as easily during harvest because you have to basically wet and re-dry the seed in most cases. Um, the requirements for hot water would be this range of temperature. We tend to use the lower range, the 42 degrees, um, because that's really effective for most disease. Uh, 15 to 25 minutes is your typical time. You typically would fully immerse your seed in cotton bags or some kind of screen that the seed cannot get through. Um, you need some kind of a temperature, a setup that has a temperature control. So the butter, uh, the cheaper option is some kind of a deep fryer. They're often sell, sold as turkey fryers. They can be as low as $50 US. Um, the better option is a lab grade water bath. You can buy these relatively cheaply online, and this won't damage the seed if you do it carefully. I don't recommend doing this on a stove top. It's much too easy to damage seed that way. Okay, this is, oh, this is a picture of what our shaking water bath looks like. It's a pretty small contraption. The water goes in the interior of, that you see there. There's uh, that little coil that you see at the back is where the thermometer goes, and that whole thing, that plate at the bottom shakes to, to stir the water and you just leave it in there for 15 minutes in bags. It's pretty simple. Um, bleach. Uh, this is the only other option for organics. Uh, the advantage is that it's fast and easy. Uh, you don't really need any special equipment. You can do it during washing of your wet seeded crops. Um, it will never completely eradicate disease, but it can definitely reduce it. Uh, it's the only option for large seeded crops because you can't hot water treat those. They're too prone to um, it would imbibe water and then not dry down again. Uh, they really they really tend to be damaged by hot water treatment. Um, the disadvantages are that you aren't going to get rid of your disease completely. You can damage the seed coat. Uh, this is easy to do. It doesn't necessarily affect germination, but it sort of cosmetically looks very odd. Um, and it does only kill the disease on the outside of the seed. It doesn't do anything about an internal disease. So it's typically a 5 to 10% bleach for 5 to 10 minutes. Um, you can do it, as I said, by adding it to your final wash or rinse step during wet seed harvest. And it's pretty simple, very straightforward. Um, and that is pretty much what I have. I have some resources here that um, if people would like to have these. Um, these are some print resources. These are some online resources. And uh, the very best um, I'm going to go back a second. The very best uh, resource of any sort is um, 
bot is this number four on this list, diseases and pests of vegetable crops in Canada, which I heard a rumor is going to be republished online, which would be fabulous because it's it's now 20 years old and definitely we uh, have I've used it extensively and I would love an updated version. So that's very good news. And that is what I have. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jody, for that presentation. Um, at this point, we're kind of at our Q&A period, so any participants who are on the line and have questions about any of the three presentations, feel free to type them into the chat pod at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Um, I might kick things off here, bring John back to answer a question. Um, John, in your presentation, you talked a lot about kind of the natural diversity within OP varieties. I thought that was really interesting, but I wonder if there's maybe a tension between, for someone who's a bit newer to, to seed saving, between differentiating an off type from the kind of diversity that might be kind of natural and healthy in your seed crop. Yeah, that's a <clears throat> excuse me. That's an excellent question because there is um, uh, there certainly is a, a tension, as you say. There's, you know, how how the heck do I know what is not, uh, acceptable variation and w where is that line that goes over to um, unacceptable and I have to set time and you just have to be a, um, a seed grower and do it and you this is why also we always stress so much in all of our classes that you have to grow trials you have to look at a number of different varieties of that same crop type especially different strains of the particular varieties you're interested in, if there are multiple strains, there are sometimes, sometimes not, um, and you just have to familiarize yourself with the crop, and I don't know of any necessarily uh, rule of thumb or shortcut, um, it's really getting to know that crop, and the best, the best seed growers and certainly the best uh, people who maintain good open pollinated varieties, which is truly a lost art, most uh, people at at seed companies don't know how to do it anymore, especially the seed companies that do the production and grow a lot of hybrids. They've, it's kind of a lost art that's forgotten. So there's no other way to, to do it than get a sense of it and really learn that crop well. It's hard to know it for all crops. You have to learn it kind of one crop at a time. I don't know right. if there's anything, I, I wish I could say more than that, you know, specifically. This is where we like to, in field days, we like to get people out in the field and, you know, dig up a row of carrots and look at them and kind of give people a sense of it. And that's really, there's no, there's truly no replacement for that than that experiential part of it, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I guess I also have a question. I see someone's typing. Well, I'll, I'll take advantage of the space while I have it here. Um, sure. Did Jody spoke about several um, several different treatments for uh, seedborne disease once you find them. I don't know a lot about this, but I have been hearing a little bit more uh, lately about uh, UV treatments that are maybe up and coming. And I wonder if you've uh, heard anything about those or could speak to them at all. Um, I have heard probably as much as you have that um, they're up and coming. People are working on researching them. Um, and I don't know much more than that. I don't know what kind of specialized equipment they'll require. Um, they'll certainly require something that we wouldn't normally have home. And I don't know what the organic, um, UV and organic don't go together so naturally. <laughs> Right. I don't know what the organic status would end up being on that. So I, I think I'm kind of waiting to hear which direction it's taking. But certainly it's something we're going to hear more about and I'm curious about. Great. Well, me too. Um, and Linda, I wonder, we have a webinar coming up in a little while that focuses more specifically on kind of post season considerations like storage, but your talk did have me wondering a little bit about the danger of pests for people who are, who are storing their seeds once they're harvested. And I wonder, I wonder if you could speak to some of the main threats that might, that might happen with pests specifically in that time. Well, after harvest, um, there are seed weevils, well, there are seed weevils and, and some and other things that are stored product pests that will attack a crop that's being stored. 
Um, once your seed is absolutely dry, you can make sure that it is clean of insect eggs that would have been laid in the field and, you know, to hatch into larvae that would chew onto your seeds. You can freeze it. And freezing seed essentially, it, does, it sterilizes the seed from the point of view of having insects on it. So once it's absolutely dry a week in the freezer or a, long enough to ensure that freezing has gone through the entire seed mass um, is enough. Now that doesn't prevent it from being reinfested when you bring it out. But mm. if you put it in, in, the, in some kind of uh, airtight container and then freeze it and leave it in the airtight container, then it won't be reinfested. So that, that's really the main thing is seed weevils and, and stored product pests getting in after the fact. And they're all Can they're I all um, add one thing to that? Yeah, of course, please do. Um, just giving a seed company perspective on that, the, um, the most problematic pest uh, for storage is grain moths, and yeah. at least from yeah. almost all the seed companies we know of. And they are an unusual crop, unlike weevils or beevil, beetles, which will die, the seed, the eggs will die in freezing. Grain moths' eggs tend to be pretty resistant to freezing. The larvae are very susceptible, and the adults are very susceptible. So, but managing, keeping the eggs off is so incredibly key, and that's where we we have uh, had a grower recently whose crop was infested just because it was left out too long on a screen drying, and you know, moths started to lay eggs on it. So, getting, I think the the point of getting that crop quickly through the harvest, the drying, and into something airtight con contained, like Linda said, is really, really important. Um, you, uh, are you, is he using, or would they be using pheromone traps for the moth, trapping for the moth presence? Because you, that's usually what they do in warehouses, we are, pheromone trapping, just to see if, for monitoring. Yep, we, we use pheromone interruption, mating interruption, throughout the whole warehouse now to avoid um, egg laying. Yeah. Um, Jody, if I could ask uh, quick, um, and I have a little experience also with the moths, um, as we all do who grow seed, but um, how, how was it that you said the grower could have prevented getting them? It was just the, purely the leaving them out too long? Uh, yes, exactly, the like not leaving, leaving the seed out too long. I was just making the point that getting that seed into a, into a sealed container as quickly, as soon as it's dry, is really wise. Because we lose, once the eggs hatch and larvae start to eat seed, all of that has to get cleaned out of the seed, and it's a lot of loss of seed. Yes. Um, yeah, this, virtually. This can... a, this... Oh, sorry, I wanted to interrupt. It was Linda. This is a, a really ideal place to use diatomaceous earth. That is a seed treatment um, for food grain crops, and they, they electro, electrostatically spray it into grain elevators and mix it into the um, seed at a certain you know, proportion. And as long as it's present, it's always acting, whether the seed is however long the seed is kept. So any eggs that were there the minute they're hatched, or even it would affect the eggs. I wonder if that would be more useful. Um. Yeah, potentially. I think a white powder on seed has its other issues. <laughs> but um, well, I was the, the, say, yes. even in the food crops, the, in the food crops, there's a certain proportion that they can use. It affects the um, stacking and packing of the grain, but you you know you you don't need very much. This is like literally electrostatic kinds of coating to a seed ele uh, to a grain huh. elevator, and then they auger it in as it goes through. And it's it's completely non-toxic, I and mean, it's in the physical control. So it's just as long as it's there, it's there. I always used it in seed when I That's had uh, a farm in Prince Edward Island because I didn't have electricity to have a yeah. freezer. <laughs> but it's uh -huh. a possibility anyway. Huh. That's it's, interesting. Um, I, I would love it if someone to checked. And and I would say it would be important to check if it is uh, under the organic certification, which sometimes things that you may think are completely acceptable or not. For... It is OMRI certified for certain things. I have to go and look, check on it for some. Oh, it is. Okay, one good. Brand you want to look at. It, Permagard is one brand. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones. Have a Great. Look. Permagard. Thank you. Thank you. I, I noticed a question has come in from a participant from Harmonic, and it's for John. 
Uh, the question is, yes. in regards to maintaining a zucchini variety like Dark Star, could you comment on flesh color in terms of lutein content and idiotype? Uh, interior flesh tends to be either creamy white or darker yellowish. Uh, so the question there that maybe they can question, I'll put back that perhaps Harmonic can um, answer while I'm saying the next part is, um, so they notice, is there truly the variation where some are truly yellow versus the uh, creamy white? Do they see that frequently when they've cut open dark star at full maturity? And then I will say, in uh, because I have experience from this from when I was a grad student, looking at lutein in um, zucchini, among other things, is, um, yes, first of all, lutein is the pre pre predominant uh, carotenoid in uh, dark green skinned zucchinis, and sometimes it is present in the flesh as well. I think uh, because we did keep dark star pretty diverse from the time of the breeding, um, that there may be variation in that. And from my experience in zucchini, the uh, similar to cucumbers as well, is when you do get pigment in the flesh, it really only appears at, uh, most of it appears at the end of the maturation of the fruit, when it's fully grown fruit. Um, so I'm looking for the answer to that from Harmonic, was it? Do you always see both kinds? I saw she was typing. He or she. But certainly we do know that Dark Star being one of the very dark green exterior um, uh, zucchinis would be much more apt to have that yellow. Yes, flesh is white and yellow. Yes. So certainly you could select for that the, the, and then perhaps you'd get a little more lutein earlier in the season, but um, that would be something to watch. That would be a fun thing to watch. The, the variation is, uh, would be inherent to having a more variable uh, OP, which is what we were shooting at, shooting for at the, with the breeding of that variety. So hope that helps. Great. Thank you. Um, there are a couple more questions coming by the looks of things. I might throw one out to, um, oh, did you want to comment on that last comment there, John? Smaller fruit noticeably yellow? Say if smaller, yes, I can comment on that. If smaller fruit is noticeably yellow flesh, it seems to me that would be a wonderful thing to, uh, if you had a large enough population, remember with uh, these things, make sure you have enough plants out there so you can get rid of the, the whiter ones. But to select for uh, a pale yellow, I can't imagine it's very dark green yellow, would certainly up your uh, lutein in the flesh if you wanted to make it more um, nutritionally significant. Would not be a bad thing to do. Or if you say, well, white flesh is more pleasing and most of the lutein is going to be in that exterior dark green uh, peel, then uh, you can go either way. That's up to you. I think that should do it. Good, thank you. Great. Um, all right, well, I'll maybe throw one more out to, to all of you and just, I'm kind of wondering from your perspective, we, I kind of kept you pretty strictly to your time, but if each of you wanted to just go around and maybe give a top piece of advice for, uh, for our seed savers and producers on the line about the, the best thing they could do this season to increase their chances of success, uh, kind of a, that, that, I think that would be great and really interesting to hear. Maybe starting with um, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Put you on the line. Um, put me on the line. The best chances of success. I think I started out talking about that. I think that um, the best thing you could do is get your soil tested and try to really focus on making sure your plants have everything they need because they'll do a lot of their own work for you if they have enough nitrogen they and seed crops really want a lot of nitrogen they need a good balance of all their nutrients but they also really can the more nitrogen they have the more seed they make for you so the better you can feed your plants the more yield you'll get that's my best advice great thank you um 
John or Linda? Um, John or Linda? <laughs> uh, this is Linda. Um, I think the, the best thing that I would say would be, uh, uh, well, on top of how essential it is to don't panic before, whenever you see anything that's going wrong, make sure you get a good identification before you take any action. Um, I, I think that's probably the most important thing. And I guess the next thing would be to assume that from the point of view of insect control, there are probably enough natural enemies out there that are going to do most of what you need to do. So just assume when you're planning your fields that you will, in fact, plan to attract them and just plan that into your, um, your, your farm system. And uh, lots of times they'll cut off a problem or deal with it. You won't even have the problem. You won't really know whether they did it or not, but they're there and they're actually taking care of things before you even know that, the, that something is arising. Have a lot, I think have faith in the fact that there's a lot of um, pest management going on out there that you don't need to get worried about. Great, don't panic is great advice in all kinds of areas. <laughs> and Absolutely. John, finally over to you. Yeah, I would, one thing I would say that uh, I really enjoyed Linda's talk, I enjoyed all of the talks very much, very good summary from both Linda and Jody. Um, I would say one of the plants we've had great success in, if I, you don't mind me stepping into entomology a bit, is uh, we have a number of growers now growing phacelia, oh, yeah. uh, sometimes called bee plant. And it has been uh, an incredible attractant to beneficials for, especially for here locally, we have a grower who's using it for controlling aphids in his Brussels sprouts. He grows from five to seven acres of Brussels sprouts a year, very important uh, certified organic crop for him. And he now puts every sixth bed in the field in both his Brussels sprouts and cabbage, two crops notoriously that attract aphids, especially Brussels sprout. Um, and the Physelia, over, over time, it didn't happen immediately, but over two or three years of doing that, he's brought in much higher rate of um, some of the parasitic wasps and also uh, hoverflies that will control uh, aphids. So it's been uh, Physelia, P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A, -A, uh, common name, that's the genus, but common name, bee plant, if you can find it, it's pretty easy to find on, online. And it, it, the beauty of it is it flowers um, through, throughout the whole season. So it flowers from, if you're planting it this time of year, it is frost tolerant, can be planted early in April. Um, it will flower right up until uh, first hard killing frost. So you have constant uh, uh, food and, and as well, those beds serve as beautiful habitat in the field for, um, for the uh, insects that they attract. The only other thing I'd say as far as the seed thing is grow those trials. And it looks like one of the questions that's come up here, I'm going to talk about trials as well. So I can segue into that whenever you're ready. Great, yeah, I might, uh, I might read that just in case we have folks who joined us for audio and not visual, but the question is from Abir in Ontario, who's a regional coordinator of the BAUDA program, and for that program, there yes. are growers that are participating in some trials on identifying OP spinach varieties and Chinese cabbages. Um, so can you provide some crop-specific considerations to think about while we're trialing those varieties and then later on when we're making selections? Yes, very good, uh, good question. I understand uh, what they're up against with this. So first of all, I can talk a little bit uh, better about spinach in general than Chinese cabbage, which I do not have much experience with. But I will say this as the blanket for both, and then I can maybe talk a wee bit quickly about uh, specifics on spinach. Uh, but trials, trials, trials. I can't stress that enough. And to do good trials, you have to get good material to evaluate. So Chinese cabbage and spinach, for that matter, are two crops where there's a real um, dearth of um, open pollinated non-hybrid varieties. So it's very hard to, it's, it, very frequently people go to the, the common, most common seed catalogs and they give up and they say, well, I found one Chinese cabbage that's an 
OP and that's it. Um, so it can get discouraging. So that's when I would say go to really, you have to take the time and go to the world. Uh, go as far as you can to, to uh, Europe, beyond. It would be wonderful if we could get more um, Asian uh, seed catalogs. They do grow both of those crops and have a wealth. And sometimes in other parts of the world, you will find OP varieties that you can't find in the U.S. We recently, after being faced with only finding five or six open pollinated onions uh, in, available in North America, we went abroad and we took three or four weeks to do a couple hours a day of looking and calling up people, talking to people, and we managed to finally unearth about 30 open pollinated onion varieties. So, but it took a lot of work, two hours a day for three or four weeks, literally, is the time we invested in it. So I would say do that as much as you can before the season starts. Um, specifically with spinach, just to make sure I answer this question, um, uh, so the considerations, the other thing is really learn, this is where you have to become the uh, samurai warrior and whatever crop you're evaluating and learning all of its characteristics. Learn about what are the best seasons to grow it, when is the best time to evaluate it to get the, the um, in other words, to plant it, grow it through to maturity, to vegetable maturity? When is the best time to do that so that you really see what it looks like under optimum? And then also do it, in the case of spinach is a great example, the, the best spinach is planted in late summer, uh, and I'm almost at uh, 48, uh, 48th parallel to southern Canada here, um, we plant by late August here, uh, third week of August, and then that gives us beautiful late September, early October spinach that unless you have severe frosts in the far north before the third week of September, you know, you really get to see what spinach looks like when grown properly. And then alternately, so get as many varieties as you can, test them out under ideal conditions. You could still do that this year, and then next year test them under those harsh spring conditions of planting um, now or even before now, if you can, depending on your climate, um, and seeing how it does in spring. And then you can evaluate things like which are the ones that bolt the fastest. Spinach in spring is going to bolt much faster uh, than fall, fall planted spinach will not bolt. So you have to ask those kind of questions. Get to know the crop and try to get as much germplasm from far-flung places. Make friends with people in other, in far off places, seed people are always friendly and will give you advice and help and try to source germplasm. Put the, put the time and effort in to do a really good trial. That's most instructive of all. Thank you. There, I tried to spit that all out. <laughs> Fabulous. That's great, John. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, Abby you. might be typing a follow-up here. Okay, great. Um, so yes. questions are a little bit uh, slower coming through, so I might uh, I might start to wrap up here and just say thank you so much, John, Linda, and Jody, for joining us today and presenting such useful and timely content. Um, I'll be posting a recording of the webinar pretty much as soon as we're done here online where it will continue to be available as a resource for folks to access at their leisure. We mostly are talking at this point in the program to people who spend more time in the field than at the computer, so I think that will be a really valuable resource for, for quite a while to come. So thanks to you three very much, and thanks to those of you who joined us online and on the phone call. Um, it's been lovely to have you. Uh, stay tuned to the website, and we will be posting updates about the next webinar when we have them.